Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to SRUK's fourth webinar in recent times and our first webinar of 2021 titled Understanding and Managing Raynaud's with our expert speaker today, Dr. John Paulin, who I'm very excited to be joined with. Um, good afternoon, Dr. John Paulin. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks for uh, arranging this. It's today, an absolute Dr. pleasure. Um, so our webinar will be structured in two parts. The first part will be a presentation by Dr. John Paulin, and the second part will be a Q&A opportunity uh, where I will encourage you all to send in your questions. Um, and we will do our best to answer as many as possible. The agenda for today's webinar uh, includes going over the risks, the treatments, management, symptoms, and much more. And this webinar will be recorded and will be going up on our YouTube channel, We Are SR UK, in the coming week. Um, so I do recommend everybody go on to our YouTube channel, We Are SR UK, and to subscribe and um, to see what other resources we have over there and to keep up to date. Uh, so our expert speaker, Dr. John Paulin, is a consultant rheumatologist at the Royal National Hospital of Rheumatic Diseases and is also a senior lecturer at the Department of Pharmacy and Pharmacology at the University of Bath. Um, I can see our participants are rising. So far we have 158 and it's rising very quickly. Let's give a minute or so to allow as many of our attendees to join as possible. This has been our most popular webinar by far, so I'm very excited today. We have uh, Alison joining us today. We have Andrea, Andrew, Bridget, Carol, Caroline, the list goes on. Welcome everyone, very happy to be having you on today. And if you would uh, like to support SRUK, you can donate five pounds by texting SRUK webinar to 70450, 70450. And that is a five pound donation, which will be five pounds plus one standard rate message. And without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Paulin, who will be sharing his screen. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to um, talk to you today about Raynaud's phenomenon. I hope you can see my screen okay. Uh, and thank you for the lovely introduction as well. And to all the great work that SRUK do for people with Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, and of course, systemic sclerosis. So this was Morris Raynaud, who over 150 years ago, described a number of patients that he'd encountered in Paris and France, uh, who had problems with the blood supply to their fingers. And he described one such case, and these are the words he used. So under the influence of a very moderate cold, and even at the height of summer, she sees her fingers become exsanguine, completely insensible, um, meaning numb, and of a whitish yellow color. This phenomenon happens often without reason, lasts a variable time, and terminates by a period of very painful reaction during which the circulation is reestablished. And he then went on to say, this affection is very common and there is hardly a doctor who has not had many opportunities of, of observing it. So I think even 150 years later, this stands the test of time as, as a wonderful description of Raynaud symptoms. And, uh, and these are the, the phenomenon that bears his name. And what he's almost certainly describing in that particular case is a case of primary Raynaud's phenomenon. So we use the term primary Raynaud's phenomenon when there's no associated uh, underlying health problem or condition driving the abnormal blood supply to the fingers. Uh, 
and this is extraordinarily common affects about one in ten of the general population if you restrict that population to just females the problem uh, is probably even more common than that maybe as high as uh, one in six or one in seven of the general female population the reason rheumatologists are interested in Raynaud's phenomenon isn't so much this fairly benign if not intrusive vasospastic disorder of primary Raynaud's but it's secondary Raynaud's uh, that is of particular interest to uh, doctors um, interested in systemic sclerosis and other related disorders. And we use the term secondary Raynaud's when the Raynaud symptoms happen because of an underlying health problem. And there's a whole raft of different health problems that can affect the blood supply to the fingers. This can be hormonal problems, such as problems related with your thyroid or adrenal glands. It can be related to compression of the blood vessels um, in the neck or the upper arm. It can be caused by a blood disorder itself, so thickening of the blood leading to little blood clots um, or other uh, congealed aspects of the blood coming together within the blood vessels to block the flow of blood within the fingers. Certain medications can cause or aggravate or probably more likely unmask Raynaud symptoms. Uh, the one that commonly is implicated in Raynaud symptoms is uh, beta blockers, which are drugs that are commonly used for people uh, following heart attacks and other uh, cardiovascular diseases. Um, certain cancer treatments as well can sometimes cause uh, Raynaud's via different mechanisms. Uh, nerve damage is something that can lead to Raynaud symptoms because our nerves are very important at regulating the size of blood vessels and can therefore cause issues that lead to the blood vessels of the fingers being narrowed. And then there are the autoimmune rheumatic diseases. And these are the diseases that uh, myself and my rheumatology colleagues are particularly interested in. And as SRUK's name suggests, the one that we're is of particular interest is systemic sclerosis, uh, which thankfully is extremely rare, only affects about one in 5,000 people, but almost all of those people will experience symptoms of Raynaud's phenomenon. So I mentioned the frequency of Raynaud's symptoms is around one in 10 people. Actually, if you look at different uh, populations of people, you'll find different rates uh, of Raynaud symptoms. And so uh, there was a study uh, led by um, Hildegard Marik in the 1980s that looked at the prevalence of Raynaud's symptoms in, in ladies. And they found that in Charleston, North Carolina, it was about 6%. Uh, whereas in parts of France, in different parts of France, the, rate, uh, the uh, prevalence of Raynaud symptoms varied from 10% to 20%. So why could this be? Well, one of the reasons is almost certainly seasonal variation in weather. And what you'll find if you look at as the rate rises across these different areas, the mean temperature in January uh, falls. This Tarantaise is uh, an area near the Alps. And so there definitely seems to be a link between how cold uh, it is um, and the prevalence of Raynaud symptoms. And as many of you will know, we're currently celebrating Raynaud's Awareness Month. Uh, which understandably is held in February because this is a time of year that's particularly difficult for people with Raynaud symptoms. As is often the case in medicine, the picture is slightly more complicated than that because when uh, Hildegard Marique went back to um, investigators in Estonia, which is where she was originally from, where they have extremely cold winters, they actually found that the prevalence of Raynaud's was actually a little bit lower than in some of the warmer climates in France. And this demonstrates the fact that people with Raynaud symptoms become very adept at managing their symptoms uh, and habituating to their symptoms, which find, uh, makes their symptoms more manageable to the point where some people would deny they actually had a problem at all. So uh, this is uh, Thomas Barlow, who translated Morris Raynaud's original thesis into English. And when he did so, he collected a number of cases that he was seeing in London around this time, looking for similarities uh, with the, some of the cases that Morris Raynaud had described. And he described this lady, so a woman who for five years had suffered during the winter with hard yellowish patches on the extremities, which subsided on the return of spring. 
Ultimately, the fingers became permanently altered in that the extremities became cold, hard to touch, somewhat insensitive and decidedly atrophied, which means that the tissue of the, actual, of the ends of the fingers had um, shrunken away slightly. The last fingers uh, joints were contracted in a state of semi-flexion. And the patient was liable to crises from time to time during which the finger reddened, became painful, and ulceration occurred, which took a long time to heal. Now, to anyone reading this 130, 140 years later, this is a very, very classical description of systemic sclerosis, although that wasn't fully recognized at the time. But it helps explain why this term Raynaud's phenomenon is used to describe both people with fairly benign but intrusive vasospastic disorders, such as primary Raynaud's, to people with systemic sclerosis, whose impaired blood supply to the fingers can be so severe that it can lead to damage to the tissue itself and ulceration. So we've heard in some of these descriptions uh, from the 19th century, the, the, the importance of these color changes that we see in the fingers of people with Raynaud's phenomenon. And the three classic color changes that are described are white, blue, and red. Uh, white is when the blood supply to the fingers is cut off as the vessels constrict or narrow. The blueness in the fingers occurs when oxygen that is trapped within the skin uh, loses the blood uh, in the system. And this is why our veins can appear blue at times because our veins carry blood in which the oxygen has already been taken out of the bloodstream and put into the tissues. And then this red attack is the, the period up, which is usually towards the end of an attack of Raynaud's where the blood supply to the fingers can actually increase considerably. We call this hyperemia, where there's too much blood flowing into the fingers. And sometimes this can be the most painful aspect of a Raynaud's attack. So what other features are, uh, are characteristic of Raynaud's phenomenon? Well, as again, many of the um, descriptions we've had already have described the symptoms are often triggered by cold exposure uh, or emotional stress can be an important trigger, particularly in primary Raynaud's phenomena. It seems to be more important than in secondary Raynaud's. And we know that emotions can affect the way our blood vessels behave from blushing, which is where uh, the blood vessels in certain parts of our body actually dilate in response to stress. Uh, pain is a near universal feature of the uh, of Raynaud's attacks. And this is because when the blood supply to the fingers is impaired, the, this leads to uh, reduced oxygen and nutrient supply to the ends of the fingers, or, and what we call ischemia. And this ischemia in any part of the body, whether it's within the heart or within the fingers in a Raynaud's attack, is often associated with pain. You also get this loss of the normal nerve function, which can lead to numbness, tingling, or burning within the fingers. And the combination of pain and numbness leads to an inability to use the fingers. So people will often describe being unable to take um, coins out of a purse or uh, do their uh, buttons up when their fingers uh, become cold or affected by Raynaud symptoms. This actually has a big emotional impact. So it causes frustration, embarrassment, sometimes irritation, anger even. And all of this impacts on patients' ability to plan their daily routine. And it impacts on their social participation, but also their work participation. And some, sometimes people have to change the ro their role within the workplace to accommodate symptoms of Raynaud's phenomenon. If they if it impacts on people's social participation, it can affect the ability to undertake outdoor sports, which can lead to social isolation. And all of this can have a big impact on quality of life. And certainly for people with systemic sclerosis, and particularly those who've previously experienced ulceration in their fingers, severe Raynaud symptoms can lead to concerns for the future as to whether or not they're likely to develop more ulcers, which can be a big concern. So I've mentioned already that we use this term Raynaud's phenomenon to describe really a very broad um, group of disorders ranging from this fairly benign uh, vasospastic disturbance of primary Raynaud's phenomenon, which can be very severe, but, uh, but on the whole isn't associated with tissue injury or ulceration to conditions like systemic sclerosis. And whilst we use the same term to describe the symptoms that people experience, and actually the symptoms between these two conditions are near, nearly identical 
uh, in terms of the actual character of the symptoms and the digital color changes people described. But when you actually look at the blood vessels, either under a microscope or using a technique called nail fold capillaroscopy, where we actually use a microscope to look at the uh, size and shape of the blood vessels and or specifically the blood vessel capillaries at the nail fold, you can see that actually there are really striking differences between these two conditions. So in people with primary Raynaud's phenomenon, these capillaries are all roughly the same length and size and shape. And over a period of appro approximately one millimeter, which is roughly the, um, the width of this image, there should be about 10 or 11 capillary loops within uh, that millimeter uh, distance. And if you look under a microscope, the normal blood vessel wall has multiple different layers, which are made up of different types of muscle and other connective tissues, but there should be a, a very clearly uh, delineated space within the middle, which is the area which the blood actually flows. When you look at people with systemic sclerosis at their nail for capillaries, you can see that the, the number of capillaries is significantly reduced and the capillaries that are present are often quite abnormal in their shape and size. So you can get larger blood vessels than expected. We call these giant capillaries and you can get these very abnormal looking, people have described them as looking like bushes or bushy capillaries which is where these blood vessels have formed quickly, uh, but somewhat erratically leading to these unusual shapes. And if you look under a microscope as a blood vessel of somebody with systemic sclerosis, the layers of the normal blood vessel have become quite considerably thickened, which leads to reduction in size of this space in the middle where the blood needs to flow. And we say that this space has become obliterated. And sometimes we'll use the term obliterative microangiopathy to describe what is happening to the blood vessels in the fingers and, else, and other tissues of the body in people with systemic sclerosis. And these striking differences between primary and secondary Raynaud's is something that we as clinicians use as diagnostic tests to help identify people with systemic sclerosis and related disorders. So, is Raynaud's phenomenon a problem in systemic sclerosis? Well, the fact that we've got nearly 200 people on this webinar suggests it certainly is. And actually people have done surveys of nearly 500 patients with systemic sclerosis and asked them of all the symptoms they experience on a daily basis, which symptom bothers them most frequently and most significantly. And almost top of that list is Raynaud's symptoms. And in fact, it's the highest uh, disease related symptom that's listed uh, within that survey. So how do we go about diagnosing Raynaud's phenomenon? So we start by taking a detailed history and we examine the hands. Um, and this is the type of referral we may get. So somebody uh, who hasn't developed any skin thickening of systemic sclerosis, but they've presented with Raynaud symptoms and a sore on the end of a finger. We use thermal imaging sometimes to look at the blood vessels, um, how the blood vessels in the fingers respond to a local uh, cold challenge. And uh, this lady's uh, thermal imaging has shown that the fingertips are significantly cooler than the backs of the hands, which is consistent with Raynaud symptoms. I've already mentioned the capillary changes that we see. Uh, and here we can see giant capillaries, which are very suggestive of systemic sclerosis. But again, this loss of the normal hairpin loops that we expect to see in the uh, capillaries of the fingernails uh, and the, these abnormal bushy vessels. And then the other tests that we as clinicians rely heavily upon are antibody tests. And this particular image shows an antibody called anti-centromere antibody, which in certain cells, you can see a very distinctive pattern emerge if that cell is in the right period of its uh, replication. And this is uh, very characteristic of these anti-centromere antibodies. So from the, this history and examination, these microvascular imaging studies and these antibody tests, even though this person doesn't have any skin thickening, we can make a very confident diagnosis of scleroderma or systemic sclerosis and then plan management accordingly. Unfortunately, diagnostic delay is a major problem in systemic sclerosis. And we know that around one in four female patients with this limited form of systemic sclerosis, which is often associated with minimal or no skin thickening, will wait over 10 years from their Raynaud symptoms first developing 
uh, before they're actually diagnosed with systemic sclerosis. This was a study undertaken in Canada. Uh, with SRUK funding, we've recently undertaken some work looking at British patients with systemic sclerosis in a large database of uh, GP records. And we identified nearly 1,800 patients uh, who we felt had systemic sclerosis. And we noted that in over half of those uh, patients, there was a diagnosis or a list of Raynaud's phenomenon or a GP diagnosis of Raynaud's phenomenon that occurred in the medical record before the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis. So these are patients who've gone along to their GP and said, my hands have become cold and white and blue and painful and numb. And the GP has told them, oh, you've just have Raynaud's phenomenon and left us at that. And then later other features have emerged that have prompted the GP to seek the help of a rheumatologist and eventually a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis has been made. Now, about one in three of these patients, the diagnosis of systemic sclerosis came within a year of their diagnosis of Raynaud's. But half of patients waited between one and 10 years, and worryingly, one in five patients waited over 10 years, which exactly replicates the data that had come out of Canada looking at this particular issue. So what this tells us is that we do still have an issue with diagnosing systemic sclerosis later than we would like, and there is an issue around raising awareness of the importance of undertaking further investigation of people with Raynaud symptoms. So what features come from the history and examination that might indicate the presence of secondary Raynaud's? Late onset is very important. So most people with primary Raynaud's phenomenon will first notice symptoms around the time of puberty or early adolescence. Uh, so between the age of 13 and 20, people will notice these symptoms. And this is re uh, relevant to uh, some of the key drivers of this. So we know that sex hormones are probably one of the reasons why Raynaud symptoms are more common in ladies than men. So it's usually after, after puberty. So, but if symptoms of Raynaud's arrive for the very first time over the age of 30, uh, then that is a, a concerning feature and one that ought to be further investigated. You should be looking for a secondary cause as doctors if people present with late onset Raynaud's. We often talk, when we're talking about systemic sclerosis, about skin tightening or scleroderma, but often in the early stages, just generalized puffiness of the fingers is a feature. So again, that's something that I would consider a red flag. The development of these ulcers or sores is certainly a red flag. And I mentioned already that primary Raynaud's isn't generally associated with tissue or skin damage. Heartburn is a very common feature of uh, systemic sclerosis. And so again, if this presents around the time of Raynaud symptoms, then that could be a concerning feature. Or if there are other features of systemic sclerosis, such as calcinosis cutis, or which are these small little calcium deposits that can occur in the skin and scleroderma, or the red spots, uh, which we call telangiectases, or other features that would make one think of systemic sclerosis. I mentioned already that scleroderma and the autoimmune rheumatic diseases is just one of many different um, conditions that can lead to secondary Raynaud's. So other features that really concern uh, doctors as to the possibility of secondary Raynaud's, or if the Raynaud symptoms are only affected affecting one side of the body or one limb, that strongly suggests that the problem can be localized to something going on within that limb or part of the body. And I mentioned blood count uh, or blood problems can occasionally cause um, Raynaud's phenomenon. So if the blood count itself has significant issues in it, then you might look for a hematological or blood cause of Raynaud's uh, phenomenon in those patients. So addressing this is issue of uh, diagnostic delay, SRUK have led an initiative called the SRUK Raynaud's Test. And so alongside uh, some patients uh, and uh, members of the team from SRUK and clinical experts in Raynaud's phenomenon from across the UK, we devised five simple questions that people could ask themselves or complete on this online using this uh, tool which asked about Raynaud symptoms. So the first question was, are your fingers sensitive to cold? And if people answer no to that, they probably don't have Raynaud's. It's such an important feature of Raynaud's uh, across all of these conditions that if the answer to that is no, then chances are uh, whatever their other symptoms might be, they're unlikely to be directly related to Raynaud's. 
The next three questions ask about the change in color that occur in response to uh, temperature change or stressful situations. We ask about this numbness or pain in the affected areas when they change color, and then ask about symptoms of stinging or throbbing when the affected area warms up. Now, if people answer yes to any of these three questions, then they may well have Raynaud's phenomenon. And then the final question asks about the development of sores or ulcers on the fingers or toes. And I've mentioned a couple of times already that this is something we would consider a red flag. And actually, for people who answered yes to questions one to four, if they answered question yeah, or if they answered yes to question five, we really strongly advise those patients uh, to go along to their GP to get some additional tests done to identify a potential cause. And we ran this initial test for a period of uh, one uh, calendar year exactly. And we had an amazing response. So nearly 19,000 people uh, from 43 different countries completed the questionnaire. In one in 20 of those people, Raynaud's was considered unlikely, but three quarters of the people who completed the test had possible Raynaud's. Obviously the type of person who'd find themselves directed to the test and, uh, will be a very selected uh, group of people who are already looking into uh, symptoms of potential Raynaud's. And many of these, I'm sure, probably already had a diagnosis of systemic sclerosis or suspected systemic sclerosis. And about one in five of the people who had completed the test had this red flag at the end with uh, digital sores. So this, again, tells us that across this group, there, there were possibly as many as um, uh, uh, 4,000 people who were reporting issues with sores on their ends of the fingers. And this is definitely a group that if they hadn't already had this investigated, we hope that on completion of the test, they did go along to their GP uh, to get some further advice on investigation and management. So talking now a little bit about management of Raynaud's phenomenon, um, parts of the UK probably look very similar to this over the course of the last week with all the snow and ice we've had. Uh, but I've already mentioned the importance of cold exposure to the development of Raynaud's phenomenon and the fact that Raynaud's phenomenon is more common in colder uh, or in countries with colder climates. And this is because our skin is equipped with these arterial venous anastomoses, which are these um, small little blood vessels that uh, link uh, the tiny little arteries with the small little veins supplying uh, blood and oxygen and nutrients to our skin. And when our body is exposed to cold, and certainly when our cold receptors perceive that our body's core temperature is threatened, these clamp down and prevent blood from flowing towards the skin. And this is something we call thermoregulation, and it's an absolutely critical part of maintaining our body's health. Because if you develop hypothermia, which is where the body's core temperature drops to a dangerously low level, it can be life-threatening. And so when our body is exposed to cold, it encourages these blood vessels to clamp down. And it's this type of action that leads to symptoms of Raynaud's occurring. Uh, and this is the other thing that leads to seasonal variation in our Raynaud's symptoms. And as you all know, that our weather, certainly here in the UK, can change dramatically. This is the university campus taken a couple of years ago on a snowy day in February. It was minus two that day. And yet within a few weeks, the temperature had increased to uh, plus 16 degrees. So we, get, we can get huge swings in temperature, not only from season to season, but within individual months. And what we found doing studies of patients with systemic sclerosis is that the number of attacks people are experiencing on a daily basis roughly doubles uh, in the winter compared with the summer. And the average amount of time that people spend in Raynaud's attack also doubles from about 15 minutes in the summer to around 33 minutes in the winter. So we know that temperature and environment and cold exposure is very important for our Raynaud symptoms. And so the first piece of advice I'd give to everybody who has Raynaud symptoms, irrespective of the cause of their Raynaud symptoms, is to keep themselves warm and in particular maintain their core temperature. So it's not enough to just wear gloves if the nape of your neck or your forearms are exposed to the cold. And I think we'll be talking shortly about some of the drugs we use to manage Raynaud symptoms, but I think if your body perceives its core temperature to be threatened, it will override the actions of any of the drugs we use to manage Raynaud symptoms. 
such as the importance of maintaining a normal core temperature to, to life. So maintaining a strong core temperature with thermals and vests and gloves and scarves and schnoods and gilets is absolutely critical to managing Raynaud symptoms. And it's probably a very effective way that people with Raynaud symptoms can help manage their symptoms better. It's absolutely critical that people with Raynaud symptoms uh, avoid cigarettes. So unfortunately, cigarettes are full of chemicals that such as nicotine, but many others, which encourage the blood vessels uh, to want to clamp down and, and constrict or narrow, which will aggravate Raynaud symptoms. And we know that people with systemic sclerosis are far more likely to develop problems with digital ulcers if they are uh, current smokers. So giving up smoking is a very important part in the management of um, um, their Raynaud symptoms. The, the other thing, of course, that, rain, that cigarettes causes uh, hardening of the arteries or atherosclerosis. So again, even if you're not noticing any immediate impact with smoking on your Raynaud symptoms, there is a significant risk that if you continue smoking, the hardening of the arteries that will occur will lead to uh, reduced blood supply to the fingers and toes that will aggravate your Raynaud symptoms in the long term. So there's never a good reason to smoke, but it's doubly important to stop smoking if you have Raynaud symptoms. And then the final one, which again links to hardening of the arteries, is to make sure that we have a healthy diet uh, and maintain a healthy weight to avoid the furring or hardening of the arteries that can occur otherwise. There are a number of drug medications that we can use uh, to help with Raynaud symptoms and all of these drugs, and there's about seven or eight different classes of drugs that we as clinicians draw upon to manage these conditions. They promote vasodilatation, which is the opening up of the blood vessels by encouraging the muscular areas of the blood vessels to relax, allowing those blood vessels to open up. And these are the, the names of some of the classes of drugs we'll use. So calcium channel blockers, an example being nifedipine or amlodipine, uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, uh, such as uh, sildenafil, whose uh, trade name uh, for one of the pro uh, preparations is Viagra, um, is a drug that we're increasingly using to manage Raynaud symptoms in people with systemic sclerosis related Raynaud's problems. There are angiotensin II receptor antagonists such as Losartan. And then a little surprise addition to this is the selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. Uh, th these were originally developed as antidepressant medications. And the the one that we're particularly referring to is a drug called Prozac or fluoxetine. Serotonin is a very potent vasoconstrictor. It, it, wants, it makes blood vessels want to clamp down. And by preventing the uptake of cells like platelets um, from picking up serotonin, it means that there's, there's a, small, a small amount of serotonin within the circulation to promote this uh, narrowing of the blood vessels. I think it's when thinking about drug management of Raynaud symptoms, it's always important to think about stopping any medications that could be worsening matters if you're able to. And the, the commonest example, which I mentioned earlier in the talk, is beta blockers. Of course, you should never stop a beta blocker without getting advice from the doctor who's prescribing you that beta blocker. And there are certainly scenarios in which it's more important for patients to remain on their beta blocker and look at other ways of managing their Raynaud symptoms than to instinctively stop the beta blocker uh, to help uh, to help with Raynaud symptoms. And we do have some patients who have Raynaud symptoms who are on a beta blocker who don't find it has any material impact on their symptoms at all. So this is definitely an area you should be discussing with your uh, doctor or rheumatologist. Some of the other drugs that we'll use to manage Raynaud symptoms are drugs that are traditionally used for managing fairing of the arteries or cardiovascular disorders such as statins or drugs that affect platelet function. And we reserve those for some people, generally patients with the more severe secondary forms of Raynaud's. As a general rule with these medications, I like to start low and go slow. And what I mean with, by that is I, if you rush in too much with a high uh, dose of some of these medications, there can be tolerability issues that will dissuade patients from persevering with treatment. Uh, and the side effects that we need to be aware of are uh, lightheadedness. As I mentioned already, many of these drugs were developed to open up blood vessels, often to lower blood pressure. So these drugs that we borrowed from the high blood pressure um, 
uh, repertoire of drugs. But there is a risk, and particularly in people who have low blood pressure to begin with, that if we start these medications, the blood pressure may go too low and leave them feeling lightheaded uh, or as if they're going to faint. And that would certainly be a reason to, to cut back on the treatment. And it's another good reason to start with a low dose and build that dose up. Some patients will experience headaches as another feature which is associated with opening up of the blood vessels. I often say that the headaches that you get with vasodilator medications will often improve with repeated dosing. And this is because the blood vessels in the brain have opened up and the brain doesn't like any changes to its normal pressure arrangement. And some of you might have experienced this uh, if you enjoy drinking caffeinated drinks. Uh, on a Saturday or Sunday, if you avoid having a caffeinated drink, you can get a slight dull headache uh, if you haven't had your normal um, dose of caffeine. And, uh, and this is similar to what we see in uh, people who are sometimes treated with drugs uh, for Raynaud's. Now, as you know, with caffeine, if you then leave off the caffeine and stay off it for a week or two, the headache doesn't persevere. And that's true of some of these medications as well. We would expect the medications to, or the symptoms uh, of headaches to often resolve with repeated dosing. Um, and if people experience that particular side effect, I will sometimes say to patients, well, it's telling us the drug is working, it is opening up the blood vessels, even though it's leading to this transient problem, which sometimes people need to manage uh, with uh, treatments like paracetamol. The important thing to emphasize is that isn't a worrying or concerning headache, and I say it usually disappears with time. And specifically people with systemic sclerosis, some of these medications can ag aggravate the heartburn symptoms, which are a feature of the scleroderma itself. Occasionally, that's a reason for us to need to cut back on the medications. So I'm going to stop talking now so that we can have a, a question and answer session, but I'll leave you with these conclusions. Hopefully, during the course of the talk, I've uh, convinced you that Raynaud's phenomenon is extremely common. And so people who are on the uh, webinar who experience these symptoms, uh, many other people are experiencing these symptoms too. The vast majority of people with Raynaud's symptoms have primary Raynaud's phenomenon, which we generally consider as a benign but intrusive vasospastic disorder. Uh, but some of the diseases that are associated with Raynaud's can actually be very serious, such as systemic sclerosis. Unfortunately, we have an issue with secondary Raynaud's and delayed diagnosis. And this is an area that we really need to do more work to improve uh, the early and prompt diagnosis of uh, treatable conditions like systemic sclerosis. Raynaud's phenomenon isn't life-threatening, but it can cause significant problems with pain, numbness, loss of hand function, social isolation, and reduced quality of life. So I think it's certainly an area where ourselves within the scleroderma community and the Raynaud's community recognize the importance of uh, learning how we can better manage these conditions. In terms of management, behavioral approaches are very important, and there's lots of modifications that patients can make to help improve the self-management of these conditions. But we also, thankfully, have a large number of different drugs that we can use to help manage these conditions as well. But the treatment generally should be focused mainly on the underlying cause of the condition. And so with that, I'm happy to end my talk, and I say start to pick up some questions. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Dr. Colin, for the... Uh, very in-depth presentation. I'm sure our community have definitely uh, benefited from that information. Um, I'd like to now take this opportunity to encourage uh, questions to come in on Zoom. So if you hover over Zoom, you should be able to see a Q&A button where you can share your question with us. And these can be put to Dr. Pauling. Just a disclaimer, we do have uh, nearly 200 participants. So unfortunately, we will not be able to answer all of the questions, but we will do our best to answer the questions that we feel will benefit um, uh, most of our community. So I can already see some questions are coming in. So we have a question that's come in from Danny and Danny says, Why, whilst my attacks have reduced, other symptoms still remain, but my GP does not support a referral. Do you have any advice for that, Dr. Pauling? Um, so I'm pleased that some of the symptoms have improved, 
but obviously if if he if there are ongoing symptoms that are intrusive and causing pain and numbness and some of these other issues then they i would encourage them to go back along to the gp the other thing is if there are these red flags so you know if their symptoms came on I, you know yeah one of the red flags i didn't mention is actually you know when men experience raynaud's usually i'm quite keen to identify an explanation for that because it is so much more commoner in the women than men so um so you know if there are red flags then really it's just a case of going back to the gp and saying um you know i'm still having problems is there anyone i could um or you know would you be willing to undertake a referral to rheumatology so i can get myself checked out and there are blood tests that the gps can do so some of these antibody tests uh, are available within the gp practice and many of our referrals are uh, arrived to us because gps have proactively undertaken tests that are available to them in the community what i would say about those particular blood tests is most gps will have access to some of the antibody tests but not all and obviously there are many causes of secondary raynaud's phenomenon that aren't related to autoimmune rheumatic diseases where those antibody tests would be expected to be negative so uh you know a negative test doesn't necessarily indicate that there's nothing the matter and that's where rheumatologists can make a useful contribution thank you dr pauling uh, we have a, another question that has come in and it has asked can severe raynaud's cause angina type symptoms so it's a very good question and it's an area that people have looked at. So people, you know, investigators have often wondered if people are getting vasospasm of the blood vessels in their fingers, is this happening in other um, vascular beds such as the heart? At the moment, we haven't been able to find conclusive proof of a link between primary Raynaud's phenomenon and future heart problems. I, my own personal bias is that there may be across the whole group not be a, a strong signal, but there might be groups of people within what we call primary Raynaud's phenomenon that are at a higher risk than others. But unfortunately, this is an area that needs to be investigated further uh, with research to better understand that link. In the meantime, if people with Raynaud's symptoms, or in fact, anyone for that matter, if they're experiencing unexplained chest pain, that itself is something that most medics would consider as a concern and something that warranted an explanation so if people are experiencing chest pain they should definitely get along to their gp thank you dr pauline um we have another question that has come in from susan and susan has said that um, she lives in ireland and she finds that the disease is not being recognized she has gone on to ask can i come back to the UK uh, for a diagnosis. So I'm assuming she's living in the Republic of Ireland. Yeah, yeah. so um, I mean, we, we've had um, doctors from the Republic of Ireland come and spend time working with us in Bath, who've gone back to work in the Republic of Ireland. So there's certainly rheumatology or rheumatologists uh, within the Republic of Ireland who I would hope would be able to help. Um, I wouldn't know what access you'd have to the UK's national health service. It would depend on um, the, your nationality and other factors. So it, it, I wouldn't want to say it, it wouldn't be possible, but it, it, there, there may be barriers uh, around that. Sorry, Dr. Paulin, I feel like I put you a bit under the spotlight with that question. Um, we have another question from Kathleen and Kathleen asks, can the disease also attack internal organs as well as hands and feet and nose? Yeah, so that's certainly a concern in secondary Raynaud's phenomenon. The, the big worry is with conditions like systemic sclerosis is that what we're seeing at the fingernails and affecting the fingers could be affecting other parts of the body. And that's something that is certainly the case in systemic sclerosis where those abnormally shaped um, blood vessels and that obliterous of microangiopathy has been shown uh, in other tissues uh, also sometimes affecting the internal organs thankfully with systemic sclerosis often different organs are affected depending on which type of systemic sclerosis you have and that's where the, the way we when we use terms like limited versus diffuse systemic sclerosis it has implications as to which organs are affected and the other thing that helps us as clinicians is the antibodies that people carry can also help predict which organs can be affected. 
For some of the other causes of secondary Raynaud's phenomenon, again, it would depend greatly on what the cause of the Raynaud symptoms were as to whether or not internal organs could be at risk. And that's where it's important to get an accurate diagnosis. And in terms of primary Raynaud's phenomenon, going back to the earlier answer, at the moment, we're not aware of any link between having severe primary Raynaud's phenomenon and having internal organ uh, complications. But I think this is an area that does need to be looked at more. Um, but at the moment, we consider primary Raynaud's phenomenon to be a benign vasospastic disorder, which is limited to the fingers and doesn't have any uh, known adverse effects on some of the more important internal organs such as the heart and lungs. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulin. We've had a question coming from Alison, and Alison has gone on to say, I have secondary Raynaud's after contracting reactive arthritis from a bacterial infection and thyroiditis. I would like to hear if people have any tips for managing their Raynaud's flare-ups other than gloves and keeping core temperature under control. Yeah, so systemic sclerosis is just one of about 20 different types of autoimmune rheumatic disease, which is associated with Raynaud's. Thankfully, Raynaud's symptoms in some of the other autoimmune rheumatic disorders like reactive arthritis tends to be milder than the Raynaud's we see in systemic sclerosis, but that doesn't make it any less intrusive from a patient's perspective. But I would say that ulcers and tissue damage related to really severe blood vessel abnormalities in the fingers is extremely rare, thankfully, within some of those other conditions. Uh, but I think if you're still symptomatic, despite adopting all the behavioral approaches that I mentioned in my talk, then that is when we should be considering drug medications to help encourage the blood flow in the fingers to improve. Uh, I think, you know, using drugs should always be, and certainly in my practice is always something that I will only consider after everything else has been tried. Uh, so, yeah, so keep warm, avoid smoking, healthy diets. Uh, but if none of those methods are making any beneficial effects, then then perhaps you need to consider medications to encourage the blood vessels to open. And that they could be via your GP or your rheumatologist. Thank you, Dr. Paulin. Uh, a question has come in from Toby, who has followed up on that and has asked, are there any herbal remedies rather than drugs that can help? Bit of an interesting question. It's it's a very good question actually, and I should have put that in my talk. So, I uh, but lots of our patients want to know about herbal approaches to managing Raynaud symptoms. The the one that has probably been evaluated the the most has been uh, ginkgo biloba, um, which is uh, a drug that's available from most high street um, herbal shops or. Um, or, 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 and even supermarkets, actually, you can buy supplements of ginkgo. And it's commonly been uh, advocated as a drug that may help with uh, memory issues because it help, it help improve the blood supply to the brain. And certainly some of our patients with Raynaud's symptoms will notice an improvement when they try ginkgo. Um, so I'd say of all the medication, of all the herbal approaches, that's probably the one with the best um, evidence base. The one that's particularly interested Scleroderma physicians have been antioxidant therapies. So some of the vitamins, such as vitamin C and E and A, have strong antioxidant properties. And we've attempted clinical trials to see whether or not these actually help Raynaud's phenomenon, which have been very difficult trials to undertake. And so the trials themselves haven't really given us an answer of whether of yes or no as to whether or not they're helpful but they certainly wouldn't be expected to cause any harm. And I think there's a feeling amongst the scleroderma community that reducing this oxidative stress may be an important way in which you can help manage and improve the blood vessel problems that occur in conditions like systemic sclerosis. Thank you very much, Dr. Paul. And do you mind just quickly spelling Jinko? Quite a lot of questions. Jinko. So it's G-I-N-G-K-O. And then it's... Biloba, so B-I-L-O-B-A. I've, I've seen it spelt different ways, actually, but it, it comes from a, the Jinko Biloba tree, is, uh, as much as I know. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulin. Uh, an interesting question has come in from Ellison, who goes on to ask, how does Raynaud's affect breastfeeding, if at all? Uh, so 
we've talked in my talk at least about Raynaud's effect in the fingers and toes, but it can affect other extremities, which include the ears, the nose, and also the nipples. So the the areola tissues around the nipples can be very severely affected, particularly actually it seems in primary Raynaud's more than scleroderma related Raynaud's. Uh, so people can get very painful attacks uh, of the nipple areas, which could impact in, in terms of breastfeeding. Although there's no studies that I'm aware of that have identified a definite link between an inability to breastfeed as a result of Raynaud symptoms uh, and breastfeeding. But I can imagine uh, it would be important to do this in a warm environment, which uh, was avoiding Raynaud symptoms whilst attempting chest feeding. Thank you, Dr. Paulin. Uh, we've had a question coming from Gabby, who asks, is it normal to experience attacks on the sole of the foot, not just the toes and fingers? The feet can take a very long time to return to normal. Right. So it, it, the soles of the feet, I would say, would be less commonly uh, affected, uh, but they could be affected in Raynaud symptoms if the larger blood vessels are being encouraged to clamp down. I think if only your feet are involved, then I think that's another area where you want to make sure that there isn't a secondary cause of Raynaud symptoms, and in particular, furring of the arteries within the the legs. Uh, so I think if if uh, if you were to not experience any symptoms in the fingers, but were experiencing this cold Raynaud symptoms effect in the sole of the feet and the toes, then I would be looking hard to make sure that the larger blood vessels of the legs. Uh, weren't affected by hardening of the arteries because there may be additional treatments such as um, angioplasty where they put balloons into hardened arteries and stretch them open that could uh, eradicate symptoms like those. So that's definitely an area I'd get that checked out at your GP. Thank you, Dr. Paulin. Uh, another question has come in, uh, this time from Saeed. Saeed goes on to ask if um, primary Reynolds gets worse with age number one, and number two, do you recommend people live in warmer places to uh, so Raynaud's? Yeah, so, so the first question around primary Raynaud's, I mentioned earlier that in ladies, the puberty can be an important um, initiator of Raynaud's or the time in which Raynaud's symptoms first emerge. And sometimes at the time of the menopause, uh, and it's you know well known that uh, hot flushes can be a feature of the menopause where the blood vessels open up too too much. So sometimes people with primary or ladies with primary Raynaud's phenomenon, as they get older, their symptoms do improve as uh, as their sex hormone levels evolve uh, with aging. Um, there are other forms of Raynaud's which could potentially get worse with age. So if, if you have Raynaud's related to hardening of the arteries, for example, and you were to continue to smoke, then you would expect that to actually get worse over time. So I think that's an, another important area where it's important to look after our vascular health if you have symptoms of Raynaud's. And then um, conditions like systemic sclerosis, there's a general feeling that they do evolve and progress over time. Although we hope that some of the medications that we use to manage secondary Raynaud's, particularly in systemic sclerosis, may help to slow the progression of the disease and prevent that worsening from occurring over time. Thank you, Dr. Pauling. We've had a question coming from Joanne, and Joanne says, I have secondary Raynaud's and systemic sclerosis. This affects my feet, and I find it difficult to walk. Uh, my whole foot uh, is in a lot of pain. Can you help? Right. So this, again, goes back to my earlier answer, and I, I'm hit heard in the question there my whole foot which you know if one side is worse than the other and the fact that the lower limbs are affected I think it's important that as clinicians we don't automatically say oh this is just your systemic sclerosis and that there couldn't be anything else the matter I think in those circumstances I would make sure that there wasn't another explanation which could be impacting in the blood flow down into that foot uh, or into both feet such as hardening of the arteries or other problems that may have occurred. Thank you, Dr. Paulin. A question has come from Karen, and Karen asks uh, about the use of Viagra for systemic sclerosis. She says, I participated in a clinical trial many years ago and found it very beneficial, but never heard any more. All right. So it, some of the clinical trials from uh, for the phosphodiesterase inhibitors 
such as sildenafil, which is also known as Viagra. Uh, some were positive, suggesting there was a beneficial treatment effect, and some were negative, suggesting that there didn't appear to be any benefit whatsoever. And so these drugs have never been approved for management of Raynaud's phenomenon in systemic sclerosis in North America or Europe. However, most of the clinical guidelines uh, on the management of these conditions are advocating the use of drugs like sildenafil, the, the more recent clinical guidelines, which is why as clinicians, we are using them more and more frequently. And we certainly find as clinicians that some patients do benefit greatly from these treatments and some don't, but we have the benefits in clinical practice of if it works, we carry on the treatment and if it doesn't work, we stop the treatment. So this would definitely if you've had this experience, having taken part in a clinical trial previously, then I'd encourage you to take this up with your rheumatologist to see whether or not a further trial of such treatments could be considered now. Thank you very much, Dr. Colin. Uh, I would just like to let everyone know we have five minutes, approximately five minutes to remain in the line. And I would also encourage uh, that no more questions come in as we're struggling to answer uh, the list of questions. Uh, but we'll give it a go. We have one that's coming from Rachel, and Rachel asks, does being underweight increase the severity slash frequency of Reynolds attacks? Yeah. So I think th this is an area that, again, I think warrants further research, but I, my personal feeling is that having a low BMI, being underweight, is a very important determinant of Reynolds symptoms. And I suspect that there are a group of patients that we currently badge as primary Raynaud's who the main reason the blood vessels in their fingers are clamping down whenever they are exposed to cold is uh, because of their low weight. And it goes back to these thermoregulatory aspects of the way our blood vessels behave and the fact that our body will do anything that's necessary to maintain its core temperature because that could be... Uh, as, uh, could, could be life threatening if our core temperature was threatened and the blood vessels didn't clamp down. So I think there is a, an, a definite link between having low weight and Raynaud symptoms. Uh, you know, so, so there are some people who are just naturally extremely slim and struggle to put on weight for a whole variety of different reasons. And in those scenarios, if, if you're unable to uh, build up your weight to a healthier weight, then I think it's extra important to maintain your core temperature with lots of layers and G-layers and thermal uh, tops and bottoms to help maintain that core temperature. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulin. We've had a question come in from Sue, and Sue says, I have primary Raynaud's, and so does my brother and my son. Can it be inherited? Yep. So again, this is an area that has been looked at so people have looked for certain genes that we think are related to the way the blood vessels behave um, and see whether or not there, there are abnormalities in those genes in families where Raynaud's clusters and we certainly find that there are some fam families where lots of people have Raynaud symptoms and other families where nobody has Raynaud symptoms so I suspect genes are an important determinant of some of these spastic disorders we know that Genes are also an important um, factor driving autoimmune rheumatic disorders like systemic sclerosis. And there has been work that's shown that if somebody in the family has a condition like systemic sclerosis, it's more likely that other members of that family will also have Raynaud symptoms. So, so I think it's a brilliant question. I think there are definitely genes that lead to this clustering of Raynaud symptoms within different families. And I think perhaps some of those families need to be more rigorous about getting themselves checked out to make sure there isn't something else going on that could explain those Raynaud symptoms. Thank you very much, Dr. Paulin. And our last question um, that, we will, that we will answer is from Cara. And Cara has gone on to say, I have found um, uh, shock changes in environments um, bring on symptoms. Um, she has also gone on to say, um, has there been any research performed into the claims of uh, Wim Hof's cold therapy? I'm not sure if you've come across Wim Hof, uh, Dr. Pauline. Well, I'm going to start with the first section. So changes in temperature is very important. So people will often find that if they go into an air-conditioned building, where it's been 30 degrees centigrade outside and 23 degrees centigrade in the shop, that change, even though 23 degrees centigrade is still warm, that change in temperature will often trigger an attack. Uh, 
So that has been very well described. I think part of that is the fact that when the temperature outside is 30 degrees, actually our brain tells the blood vessels and our fingers and elsewhere to open up to help the heat escape. And so if we go into a room that's not cold, but is colder than the temperature that it was previously become acclimatized to, often there is then an overshoot where the, the fingers, blood vessels don't clamp down just enough. They go beyond that and it can trigger a Raynaud's attack. Uh, in terms of the the other um, intervention that you described, I'm afraid I've not heard of that, so I'm not aware of the evidence. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Paulin, for the amazing presentation and um, for the amazing Q&A session where you've gone into uh, an amazing level of depth. I'd also like to thank our near 200 participants for their questions. I'd like to apologise that We've been unable to unfortunately answer all of the questions, uh, but thank you nonetheless for uh, making the session what it is and, and bringing so much value in asking all of your interesting and amazing questions. And um, I will also link a survey. Um, so um, future webinars can be adapted um, to best suit your needs. And I will just add that in very shortly uh, into the chat. C can you remind people of the number that they could text to to make a donation of five pounds to SRUK? Thank you very much, Dr. Corwin. Uh, so to make a donation of five pounds to SRUK, you can text SRUK webinar in uppercase to 70450 and that will cost five pounds plus one standard rate message. Thank you very much for the reminder, Dr. Paulian. Uh, and thank you so much to everyone for their support and for all of the donations that have been coming in. Um, and, and perhaps some of the questions that we haven't answered, could we could collate and, and then I could do a Q&A for one of the SRUK newsletters and hopefully uh, a, a, a tackle some of the questions that weren't answered on the webinar. That would be absolutely fantastic. That would be absolutely fantastic. So I've just added in the, the uh, survey link. Uh, so please do let us know what you thought of the, of the, of the webinar uh, so we can uh, best improve our webinars in future. Uh, but otherwise, I'd like to thank everyone for being involved. And again, thank you, Dr. Paulin, uh, so much for the amazing webinar session. And I'd like to wish everybody a a uh, lovely Tuesday and a lovely rest of the week. So take care, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Zaba. Thank you, everyone.